This is my little session on how I look at a CT abdomen and pelvis. This is my search pattern. This isn't necessarily the best search pattern. It's just what I've adopted over the past few years. Uh, I add stuff to it all the time, and I definitely make changes based on what the indication of the study is, and maybe look a little closer at certain things. Um, so this is just my the basic search pattern. We're not going to get into any pathology or anything, but this is just kind of what I do. So the first thing I look at is I just do a quick run through of the entire study just to kind of get the lay of the land and see what I'm getting myself into. Sometimes you can open these CTs and they're just absolute disaster post-op patients and you kind of want to mentally prepare for that. All right, next, first thing I do is I look at the heart. You will be able to catch a thrombus in the left atrium or ventricle if they scan a little far enough up or down. Um, next thing I do is I'll look at the lung bases. Look for any, sometimes you can see some pulmonary nodules down here. Then I'll take a stroll through the abdomen, make sure there's no free air. Then I'll go all the way back up and start my search pattern. So the first thing I do is I follow the GE junction or the distal esophagus down through the GE junction through the stomach. Follow it around to the duodenum. Then I follow the duodenum across midline. Pass the ligament of trites to the first portion of the jejunum. Then I check out my spleen over here. Spleen looks good. While I'm over here, I'll go from the distal pancreatic tip, follow along the body, the head, and the uncinate. And then I'll bring it back up to the top and look at my liver. So with the liver, what I do is I break it up into the... Uh, into both hepatic lobes. So I start with the left hepatic lobe. I scan through this one time and back up. Look for any masses or any weird things that catch my eye. Next I'll go to the right hepatic lobe. And then I'll switch on liver lindos, which gives you a nice harsh contrast in the liver parenchyma that can make certain pathologies stand out. Liver looks good, so then I'll go to my gallbladder if there is one. A lot of people are post-cholecystectomy, so you'll see little clips in the hilum. But for this one, gallbladder looks good. Next, I'll check out the vasculature of the liver just because I'm over here. Hepatic veins. Then I'll go to my left portal vein, right portal vein, anterior and posterior branches, main portal vein. The main portal vein, superior mesenteric vein confluence, splenic vein, and now I've essentially ruled out a thrombus in my portal venous system. Next thing I do is I go through the adrenal glands, so the medial and lateral legs, if you will, of the adrenal glands, the right adrenal, left adrenal gland. Looks good. Next I scroll through my kidneys. Looking for any stones, masses, cysts, etc. What I like to do is switch to my coronal to look at the kidneys. Sometimes you'll miss little tiny stones in here that you don't see on axial, and you see them a little better on coronal. And the same with the, you'll catch pyelonephritis on the coronal versus the axial sometimes. Then what I do is I follow my ureters down. Still going down through here. Now this isn't ideal for to look for stones in the ureter because it is a contrasted study, but you can catch a big stone in there if you see one. Then you follow the right ureter up. And as he comes across. And then what I do is I go back down, look at the bladder, make sure there's no bladder wall thickening or stone floating around in there. Again, you can switch to the chrono if you want to. Back to the axial here. Next, I look at the reproductive organs. So this is a male, so this is the prostate. Then while I'm down here, I'll look at the penis and the imaged portions of the scrotum if I can catch them. Seminal vesicles all look good. So next up, I'll start at the rectum and check out the bowel now. So 
I tend to go in a retrograde manner. So I started the rectum, follow the rectum up, come across with the sigmoid. This one takes a nice little turn backwards. So we have our ascending colon coming up, coming up. Now with the splenic flexure, so we're coming across with the transverse colon here. Hepatic flexure, descending colon. Now we come down to the ileocecal valve and our nice little appendix down here. There it is. Appendix coming across. This is pretty long appendix. It comes all the way midline and comes down around here and ends. So it's a blind ending, small tubular structure. If you can't find the appendix on the axial, you can always go to the coronal. Sometimes it helps you out a little bit. You can see it there. Just resting on top of the psoas muscle, coming across, coming down right there. And that's the large bowel. So next thing I do is I'll scroll through the vessels. Sometimes you can catch the a thrombus in the, uh, I catch a little DVT out in the visualized proximal femoral vein, which is always good to catch on both sides. So follow those vessels, internal iliac vessels, as they come together, the common iliac vessels, IVC, aorta, bring it on up. Then I'll take a look at the Celiac axis, the SMV, renal vein, renal arteries, the inferior mesenteric artery, and back down. I look for lymph nodes along the course of these vessels. You'll see them along the pelvic sidewall and along the retroperitoneum. Keep looking for all the lymph nodes around these regions. And I'll scan back and forth a few times to look for them. Next, what I do is I'll come and look at my small bowel, get an overall picture of the small bowel. You can't really trace it when it's collapsed. Um, the only time you can ever really trace the small bowel is if it's dilated, like in the small bowel obstruction. It's really easy. Um, but I come through here, look, make sure I'm not missing any giant mesenteric lymph nodes or masses. Take a look at the overall appearance of the small bowel. Make sure we're not missing any infection or whatnot. So that's all good. So next what I do is I switch to my soft tissues here. So I'll look at the anterior soft tissues first, coming up along the pelvic and anterior abdominal wall. Here's the umbilicus. It's not too uncommon to see a little fat containing umbilical hernia here. Super common. I don't even comment on it half the time. But you'll see Sometimes you'll see bigger hernias along the anterior abdominal wall. So we're all the way up to the top now, the lungs. So then what I do now is I take the posterior abdominal wall soft tissues, look at them. All the way down. Next what I do is I switch to my bone windows. Take a look at the inferior pubic rami, left and right. Pubic symphysis, superior pubic rami femoral heads. So I usually take out, I go for the left hip first, all the way up to the iliac crest, and then come back down. And I go to my right hip, acetabulum, femoral head, iliac wing. Then I come back down to look at my coccyx. And I scroll up, looking at the sacrum. Then I go up to the lumbar spine, making sure there's nothing in the spinal canal. All right, so that looks good. Next, I go to the sagittal, and I take a look at the bones on the sagittal projection, acetabulum, femoral head, iliac wing, sacrum, L5 all the way up. Take a look, make sure there's no big 
degenerative change or osseous lesion. You can catch a little bit of the sacrum in the uh, xiphoid process as well. Also, while I'm here, I'll take a look at the vessels and sagittal projection, celiac axis, SMA, aorta. What I'll do is I'll take a quick run through of the abdomen to make sure I didn't miss anything, like the gallbladder. It's easy to scroll through that because so many people have it, don't have it, I should say. And it's easy just to think it's not there. Um, so then I'll just take an overall look at the bowel and appearance of the mesentery to make sure I didn't miss anything on the axial. And everything looks good. So that is it. You have officially learned my search pattern for a CT abdomen and pelvis. All you need to do is read a couple thousand more and you'll be on my level. Or just do a radiology residency and after six years, you'll be uh, good to go. So if you have any questions, leave a comment below and I'll try to respond to them. And if not, I'll see you on the next video.